Welcome to the CNBC Africa debate, coming to you live from the Durban ICC, where the 27th World Economic Forum on Africa is currently in session. Our task over the next hour is to unpack Africa's growth outlook and to get a sense of where the continent is headed, both for our audience here in Durban and for the 48 countries across Africa who have just tuned in to this broadcast. Perhaps starting with a little context, we refer to the World Bank's stats. 2016, we know, was the worst growth we've seen in 20 years on the African continent, coming in at 1.3%. And that obviously being weighed down by slow growth in the largest economies in sub-Saharan Africa, namely Nigeria, South Africa, and Angola. But it's not an all fall down scenario. The World Bank sees growth coming in at 2.6% for 2017, 3.2% for 2018, and 3.5% for 2019. But there are risks to the scenario. On the other hand, we could shoot up on the upside. So let me, without further ado, introduce my panelists who are going to deep dive into Africa's growth outlook for the next hour. Malusi Gigaba, Minister of Finance, South Africa. Seated next to Malusi Gigaba, we have, we are, have Ulrich Spieshofer, who is the President and CEO of ABB Switzerland. Frederick Lamone, who is the Chairman of the Executive Board Vandal France, and we are joined by Wolfgang Schäuble, Federal Minister of Germany. Thank you very much, Federal Finance Minister, rather, of Germany. Thank you all very much for joining me. Let's start with the global outlook and the impact that that is going to have on South Africa. And this is the global growth environment. Minister Gigaba, you have just come back from the IMF. I think it's important to understand how you perceive the global economy at the moment and, and how it's going to impact the African stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, okay, need to get close. Thank you very much. I think, um, and, and, and greetings to fellow panelists. I think what emerges quite clearly and perhaps the positive out of the global economic outlook is the fact that at least we're growing. And there is anticipated growth globally and across the regions. The growth is slow, but it's there. It's there for the developed world. The emerging markets are the major drivers for the growth. Sub-Saharan Africa is expected to grow, and South Africa herself uh, is also growing. And there are important aspects to the growth, but there are also risks. And some of those risks include the geopolitical risks, such as Brexit, uh, uncertainties in various major economies, including the United States and China. And Going hand in hand with that is the risk of many countries becoming more protectionist and reducing international trade. That obviously will have an enormous impact for us in Africa because the, it, it, the, 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 the cost of capital, it raises the risk of um, a declining trade in an environment where Africa needs to, to trade more. We need to diversify our economies. We, all we, we are all talking about that, that we need to diversify our economies. And we wouldn't be doing that for any reason other than engaging in international trade. Even if we, prior to that diversification, as we are still looking at uh, commodity exports, we need to trade with the, inter with the international community. We need international markets. But those also create greater opportunities because in the environment of um, uh, low intra-African trade and a gr growing infrastructure investments on the continent, albeit not sufficiently, it means that um, African countries need to identify um, new markets to 
focus more on trading with one another, identify markets in emerging economies, and, and trade with those countries that um, are still open to trade. So there are opportunities globally and there are risks, but I think on the overall, we need to take a positive outlook and, and focus on what we need to do in order to grow our economies to sustain the growth over the, the medium to long term. Minister Schobler, if you could come in here, sir, on your view on the global growth outlook. We've got the French second round of the French elections just a couple of days away. Um, we've seen Brexit, we've seen the changes in the US, and I think it's very important for you to weigh in with what is happening on that global stage. I think, with all due respect, French election, Brexit, Let's set aside uh, new administration in Washington, D.C., but uh, it's n are not the major uh, geopolitical risk, with all the respects. I think uh, what we have is, coming back to, to Africa, we have, uh, we have uh, tackled the issue of inclusiveness. Because if the gap between the rich and the poor, globally as well as in our societies, is increasing, we will face major uh, political trouble. We have too much, too much trouble all over the world, and especially in Africa, we have millions, millions of migrants on behalf of uh, hunger, uh, natural catastrophes, climate change, and a lot of wars, and spreading terrorism, Islamist terrorism. That is a major risk. And therefore, if we want to fight this, we have to uh, engage ourselves, the, the, global, the global community. And that is the reason we, 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 we took the initiative, German presidency for the G20, to take Africa even on the agenda of the G20. Because if we would fail to stabilize the African continent in the years and decades to come, we would face uh, increasing geopolitical risk. And that is the challenge we face. I think we have a lot of opportunities. Uh, as uh, my fellow colleague just mentioned, but we have also some risk, and therefore we have to engage ourselves. That is the, the main issue in our And that is, the, that is the reason why our initiative on the G20 uh, to take Africa on the agenda of the uh, G20 is, has been uh, a, a forum for the advanced and emerging economies, and not for Africa, in Sweden. But we have seen it's a major concern, and all the uh, global economies have to care on Africa. And that is what has been agreed, and now we are working for this. I think, Minister Schobler, just for the broader audience, you mention the relationship with the G20 and Africa, and we had the privy of sitting in on a session which is the, the compact with Africa, the G20 compact with Africa, which is a flagship of Germany's presidency of the G20. Perhaps you could just give a, a little more detail yes, on that compact with Africa. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like only to say a few sentences. If we, we agree that we need much more investment in infrastructure in Africa to increase the intercontinental trade, it, we need much more infrastructure. That's why we need more investment, not only public investment, uh, crucial is private investment. To enhance private investment, you need uh, preconditions, you need the framework in the, sta member sta uh, the states, the nation states concerned. Therefore, we have launched this initiative for Compact with Africa to invite every African country uh, to be to, in, to uh, in, in, in cooperation with the multilateral institutions, IMF, World Bank, African Development Bank, with the member states of the C20 in partnership to what it has to be done uh, for in any, every country and its uh, specific situation to in, in improve the conditions for getting private investments. And in parallel, we encourage in the advanced economies private investors like a rental company to invest even more and we tell them, look, it is work, it will be, it will be sustainable because so the framework is granted in these in this states in which you can invest. That is, that is the philosophy of our compact with Africa. 
Well, Rich, let's talk now about private sector investment across the African continent. And ABB, we know, has been present on the African continent for 110 years. You've got about $1.5 billion invested in Africa. In fact, you are just back from Johannesburg and the inauguration of a traction transformer factory, which is going to change uh, the, the way that locomotives, it operates in the locomotive space. So you are investing deeply in Africa. Perhaps you can give me a sense of how you're feeling about the, the growth across the continent, given the very low rate of growth that I referred to for 2016 at that 1.3%. Thank you very much for the question and good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Uh, ABB is active as a technology leader in utilities, in industry, and in transport and infrastructure. And when we decide on investments in parts of the world, in markets, we don't have a short-term perspective. We take a very long-term perspective in deploying capital and making commitments. So in the last 110 years of the history of Africa, there were sometimes some ripples and waves. Uh, we did not pull out. At the moment, there are some concerns. We are not pulling out quite the opposite. We are continuing the investment path that I call a string of pearls, where we add one pearl after the other to contribute in the three sectors that we are active in the utility industry and transport and infrastructure here in Africa. There's a tremendous long-term opportunity here in this part of the world. Africa has, as an emerging market, a unique, a unique structure. There's tremendous natural wealth underneath the soil that is still to be explored. And there's a significant demand pocket, a very vast market that coincides on the same continent. But today, the problem is that a lot of the exploitation of the natural works creates jobs outside of Africa. And the consumer demand in Africa is being satisfied by imports that come from outside of Africa. So we're losing out in this part of the world as a continent on job creation, prosperity, and our wealth. Our job as industrialists is to help and make a commitment and a contribution to change that uh, situation. We have invested, we have multiple factories here in this part of the world. We have invested in people, we invest in education, and we continue to do so. And as Minister Schäuble said rightly at the beginning, the infrastructure element is a key enabler for prosperity and growth. Being a leader in this field, we have clearly said we will not contribute through imports. We will contribute by setting up a local value chain, creating jobs locally, training people, and being a partner to local governments, to local industry, to enable the growth to come. So yes, you're right, short term, there are some concerns, and there are some ripples and waves. Long term, there's prosperity possible, and we are very committed to contribute on that one. And we don't get nervous by a quarterly or a yearly little bit of a rainstorm that might be there. A little bit of a rainstorm. Let's talk about uh, infrastructure and the infrastructure gap, the lack of physical infrastructure, which sees us losing around 2% of GDP growth on an annual basis. And that's why that private sector investment is so crucial. Go back to the numbers that I put on the table at the beginning of the conversation. You add 2% to that 3.5% outlook for 2019, and you get to that crucial 5.5% GDP growth level for the African continent that starts creating jobs. I want to come now, Frederick, to you. And Vandal, again, has a rich history. Well, I suppose it's a newer history. You started investing in 2012 into the African continent. 14% of your portfolio in both the listed and the unlisted space is in Africa, 1.5 billion euros. You are now fast-tracking investment at, some would say, uh, a time where the outlook is not as rosy as it has been previously. Yeah, I think we are fundamentally a long-term investor. Uh, we are an old company founded in 1704. We have um, industrial roots. Uh, we have permanent capital. So um, a little bit like uh, ABB, but not as an industrial group, as an investor. Uh, we try to look um, at long-term trends. Uh, mobile telephony, for instance, seems to, to, to us uh, uh, an absolute uh, must for the continent. It has been growing uh, very fast. 
the number of landlines in Nigeria, for instance, is below 100,000 landlines for the whole country, but 100% of the, uh, the individuals are equipped with mobile uh, phones. Uh, it's uh, the access to internet, it's uh, absolutely essential in urban uh, environment, but also in rural environment, and we have uh, invested massively in telecom towers. So it's infrastructure, it's a company called IHS, we started to invest $125 million, and progressively uh, by building a pan Euro African uh, company in five countries, we have now uh, 25 thousand towers and we have deployed uh, more than 800 million dollars in that particular company. So we try to identify key needs for supporting the development of Africa, which um, is certainly a risk. Uh, I, I do uh, agree and I fully support the uh, priority that the G20 uh, um, has put on Africa under German uh, chairmanship. But I also believe that it's a, a great opportunity. And when you look at all the uncertainties in the so-called developed world, from uh, Mr. Trump's policies to uh, the European uh, integration uh, or uh, disintegration in some cases, and hopefully the second uh, round of the French election will turn out to be uh, a positive news about, about that. But uh, I believe that Africa, um, Africa's risk is very often overestimated. It's not easy to convince a board of directors in uh, uh, Europe to invest in Africa big sums of money, but because they, they tend to not know exactly the conditions of investment and uh, they, they, they don't see the long-term return. And when you can prove with the first steps that it's uh, efficient, then you can build great story over time. You have to absorb ups and downs and you should not, uh, you should not have to give your money back to your investors in a given uh, frame, frame of time, otherwise you, you cannot invest here. Minister Gigaba, if I could come back to you at this point, as the only African member of the G20, will South Africa forge the relationship for the rest of Africa when it comes to the G20 compact that uh, Minister Schäuble was referring to just a moment? Are you going to drive strongly the African agenda as South Africa? South Africa has always taken its interest, its, its commitment to Africa, very serious. And regard our participation in, in different international fora, including the G20, as an opportunity for the African continent to have a gateway into those institutions and for those institutions to have a gateway into Africa. And so we will play our role in terms of partnering with the G20 countries to attract investments into the African continent, we ourselves are keen to increase our partnerships with different African countries to, in infrastructure investments, to, improve, to diversify our economies and, and improve intra-African trade, and, and ensure, therefore, that the investments that come from elsewhere in the world into Africa find us as equal partners, not as helpless um, uh, uh, recipients of the wealth largesse that are just sitting waiting for investments without um, having anything back to contribute. Because in the first instance, Africa not only has vast natural resources, but Africa has a very large young population. We have a population of the future. We have therefore huge human capital we have um, a, a lot of advantages, including a rapidly urbanizing population. So all of these advantages must be taken into consideration, and Africa must use that advantage when we interact with other countries. But we must also insist, in terms of the investment programs that come into the continent, I was very happy when you spoke of localization of building local capacity, building local institutions, because we must institutionalize the investments and the developments that come into the continent as a result of those investments. You speak, Minister, about the young population in Africa and the World Bank stat is that we need to create 20 million jobs annually until 2035 to absorb new entrants into the job market. 
that is 20 million jobs on an annual basis every year until 2035 to basically cater for new entrants into the job market. I think if we can come to you, Minister Schäuble, on this in terms of the G20 and the fact that many of those countries are facing their own national challenges, the rise of populism, do they have time and the inclination to invest in Africa? It's, it's a matter of, it's a problem of time because uh, time is running out with this uh, increasing number of, of young populations. They will be educated if they will have no uh, vision for their future, we will get a lot of uh, additional instability and, and, and maybe potential of, of migrants and so on. Therefore, it is, uh, we have to, and that is the very reason why we need uh, not only public investment, but what we need is, of us, is uh, private investment. Maybe private public uh, investment together in private public partnership and so on. And we have to speed up. And therefore, uh, we want to, uh, to convince uh, African states, because private investment you only get if investors can hope with all the uh, risk sharing with uh, 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 taxpayers' uh, money. At the end, uh, private investors uh, ne need some return on investment and some security. And therefore, you need to, to, to grant the preconditions for investment. And that is, of course, a matter of the, of the, of the uh, states and the nations concerned in which you have to invest. And therefore, we need the partnership. What, what have to be done in the, in the states as well? But on the other hand, we have to convince populations that reforms, structural reforms, uh, enhancing uh, legislation for getting more, a better framework for, for private investment, you need, uh, uh, you have to show success in a short time. If you tell people, if you tell young people, this we have to invest, we make structural reforms, and you will see the return on investment in 15 years. They said, oh, it's a little bit late for a young man, we cannot wait. And therefore, we want to do it in, in parallel. The idea of our uh, 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 compact with Africa is, on the one hand, to work together in partnership with the, with the African states, and on the other hand, in parallel, to encourage private investment and say, look, Look what we are doing, look what, what's going on in, let's say, the five countries which had already engaged, the Côte d'Ivoire and Sen the Senegal and Tar Morocco and Tunisia and, and uh, with the fifth one, help me, ah, it's a, Rwanda. Rwanda, oh, Rwanda. Sorry. Rwanda is doing, by the way, impressively well. And you can see what's going on, and therefore you can be encouraged as investors, please, not, not wait, do it now. And that's what we are doing. Let's, make, let's take an example. We both will attend, I hope we both will do it, a Berlin conference in preparing the G20 summit in Hamburg. We will have in June a Berlin conference on Africa. And in this conference, we will not only explain what we are doing with the compact with Africa, but we invite German business community, come and see, come and see, look what's going on with this uh, member states of the compact with Africa and invest, come on. Invest. So put the political might of the yeah. G20 yeah. behind those investment yeah. plans presented by the African countries that are engaging with the G20. And just to highlight what Minister Schäuble has said, Rwanda, Morocco, Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire and Tunisia are the five countries that are pioneering the compact, the G20 compact with Africa. They have already presented their investment plans in Baden-Baden mid-March to the G20 community. So here we are actually seeing a tangible project in action and being fast-tracked. Minister Gagaba. If, if I may add one remark, excuse me for interruption. Uh, the COPEC with Africa is, offer, uh, is uh, invited for any African member state. Uh, and therefore the five countries already mentioned are pioneers and they should encourage other African states as well to join this initiative. So it's open for any African member state. Minister just, Gugabe, you wanted to add? Yes, just to add to what Minister Shovel has said, and in response to the question you were asking about, about the time and the risks that you, you may, that as a result of the rise in populism, you may not have the foreign governments having the time to focus on, on African investments. I just want to raise 
three urgent things that we therefore need to do. I mean, the, 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 in the first instance, we need African countries to mobilize domestic resources by increasing their own revenue bases and creating efficiency in collecting revenue from their populations to support infrastructure investments. This, is, this comes in addition to foreign investments. We must fund our own infrastructure investments and mobilize domestic resources. Secondly, we need to increase intra-African trade yeah. so that we don't rely on what happens in the environment outside, but we are able to channel and redistribute resources amongst ourselves and, and ensure that the, we, we generate revenue out of trading with one another. And thirdly, we need to listen to the African youth to draw them into the picture, politically and economically, and engage them in finding solutions to the challenges that we are facing and invest in these young people because there is a lot that they can offer as a contribution to solving the problems we are facing. Minister Gagaba, I want to just focus on your second point, and that is of intra-Africa trade. I think for the last seven years, I've sat on platforms like this, where we have discussed how important intra-Africa trade is to insulate Africa from shocks in the global economy. And yet, that figure just refuses to budge. So we're sitting somewhere between 11 and 17%, depending on what stat you want to look at. So how is it that we move beyond the talk? We stop saying that we need to fast track intra-Africa trade and make it actually happen. I think among others, there are two issues we must address. The first one is there needs to be a political will in Africa among countries to trade with one another. I always have a sense that it doesn't exist. Rhetorically, we say we are keen on this practically. And there are examples which I can cite. Um, to, to, to uh, elaborate uh, at this point. I think we need that, uh, that political will, and therefore if we, have, if we say we do have the political will, we must then decide. Because we were sitting just during the lunch with the Prime Minister of Namibia, and she was raising a whole range of challenges with us uh, while we were asking her a lot of questions about what needs to be done. And, and I think that w we need to translate that political will into practice, take advantage of the strengths of different countries and use those strengths. For example, the existence of, um, despite their financial challenges, but the existence of very well-established and well-known state-owned companies involved in infrastructure investments in South Africa, and see how we can use those to leverage global partnerships in different countries to draw the investments, to create the infrastructure networks that will support that, that intra-African trade. Minister Gigaba, in the interests of time, could I put a challenge to you, sir? Is that when we face one another again in 12 months' time, that you, with your passion, have driven that intra-Africa trade agenda across the African continent to see a substantial change in that number? Accepted? Accepted, sir? Accepted. Can we Accepted. shake on it? Yes, Thank Accepted. you so much. Ulrich, I want to come back to the World Bank and uh, certainly the, the risks, the domestic risks to that growth story for, for Africa. If we look at security concerns, at political instability, at the slippage in reforms, when do you call time out on a country? Well, for us, fundamentally, we, we call it time out when our people are endangered, when the physical and the health of our people is endangered, then we withdraw immediately and we are very, very careful. Other than that, when there's an economic environment, you, as a large player like us, if we would every time when there is a little bit of ripples and waves or uncertainty in a country, pull all the time out and then get back in, that doesn't make a lot of sense. We are in very long-term business on the infrastructure side, on the utility side, even on the build-up of industrial operations. This is not a quarterly or annual business. This is a long-term business. And therefore, it's very important to navigate the situation with a, with a high level of responsibility and be very careful what's happening. 
and assess the investments very carefully. But when you do them, you want to have a steady hand navigating through and contributing to the stability rather than accelerating and making the volatility even worse. Because I think we have a role to play as large companies, not only in terms of capitalists making money, we have also a role to play to create an environment where we can add to stability and predictability. Sometimes we might be more predictable than some governments. Sometimes we might be more predictable in terms of our credit rating than some countries. And that can help if you deploy that in a responsible way and contribute to the development. I believe fundamentally there's a, there's a very good opportunity for large players like, like ABB in the African continent. Whether it's direct investments that we do or indirect investments that, that Frederick and his team do as an investment uh, company, that doesn't matter. Uh, but if, if we do this in the right way, then we shouldn't get so nervous. The World Bank um, statistics, on the one hand, they point out a certain kind of concerns. On the other hand, the World Bank is, can also be a great partner for us in financing long-term infrastructure developments. And if you take what, it, what will happen in the next couple of years, the rail infrastructure, the electricity infrastructure, the industrial investments, education, training, all of that will need some very long-term investments. Whatever we can do to contribute to stability and a clarity and outlook, we should use the opportunity whilst being economically also responsible. Coming back to the opening of your traction transformer factory, which is as large as your factory in Geneva, might I say, and is going to supply globally in Johannesburg. Was there an instance in light of the negativity around political instability, purported political instability, the downgrades from the rating agencies, was there a time when the board sat down with you and said, should you be going ahead with your investment into South Africa? Look, when, when you take this decision, you always want to do a 360 in all the conditions that you have. And yes, there are some concerns in the environment. But on the other hand, this might be also exactly the right time to invest. You get the right kind of customer relationship. We are working with local customers. The, the how train, the transnet locomotives, they are all powered up with ABB technology. And, and we want to contribute really to that development going forward. The investment in this factory, I think, is a very nice example of the risks and the opportunities that we are facing. The way we created is we took global technology, localized it, we took African people, a couple of dozen of them, we moved them out of Africa in a couple of, a couple of quarters, drained them in other parts of the world, brought them back, and got them going. The risk, however, is if we continue with the difficulty in terms of doing cross-border trade here in Africa going forward, where the free movement of information, money, people, and goods is not as good as in other parts of the world. In fact, for us, it's sometimes easier to import from China into an African country than importing from another African country across the border. I think that's something I'm going to jump in here again in the interest of time. You answered my question uh, in terms of the discussion point around South Africa. Frederick, let me bring you back into the discussion. I think it's only fair if I put the same question to you. In terms of the domestic risks, when would you make a decision to exit a country? Security, political instability ahead of elections, and slippage in reforms, the three key risks. I, I would make a distinction. Um, we, we have our main subsidiary, Bureau Veritas, that is present in all African countries. They have been operating here, bringing trust, I mean, they are in certification, inspection, testing. Uh, it's a necessity for uh, inter-African trade, uh, for the security of consumer, security of infrastructure. So we wouldn't take, uh, except if the security of our employees would be at risk, but it has never been the case, we, we, we wouldn't uh, get out of the country. Uh, we believe that we, it, it's a fundamental service that we bring to the economy of the country. As an investor, so as a shareholder of Bureau Veritas, Vandel would certainly, each time we invest, assess the situation. And we would, it's, a, it's a yes or no decision. Uh, why would we invest in, in an African country uh, if the, the government makes an unpredictable policy? I notice in the list of countries that um, are uh, so far associated with the G20 initiative that most of these countries have a clear plan. 
They have targeted a number of sectors, like Morocco, for instance, with automotive, to make an example. Uh, or they have, uh, be, they have been extremely persistent and consistent. Think of Rwanda. When has Rwanda been unpredictable in the last 15 years? I mean, that Rwanda offers a very predictable environment. Uh, so we are uh, comforted by that. We can explain to the decision makers, uh, we can explain to ourselves when we are, it's always a collective decision that um, the risks are uh, limited. When there is a, a very uh, un um, expected reshuffling of a government when there is a uh, depreciation of the currency which uh, has not been anticipated. Foreign exchange risk is a key risk. Uh, well, it creates an instability that um, can last for long in the, in the mind because, uh, I mean, you, we are surrounded by proposals from Indonesia, from Mexico, from Brazil, not only from Africa. So uh, when we have had a bad experience, or, uh, and if our existing businesses have suffered in the country, and clearly we are extremely uh, uh, nervous about uh, the Naira in Nigeria today, uh, because yesterday, uh, clearly in last June it has been depreciated by 35%, and it could very well be the case again in 2017. So that's a major risk. We can build a number of uh, actions to, uh, to mitigate this risk, but uh, clearly we, became, we become much more reluctant uh, to trust the country and to trust uh, the policymakers of this country. Minister Gagaba, I need to come back to you at this point because the reshuffling of the political environment was brought to the table not by myself, but by Frederick from Vandal. Could you give us, you have repeatedly any assured... <laughs> It's good to have friends. You made my job much easier. Thank you very much, Frederick. You have repeatedly assured investors, specifically at this forum, that you are going to strive for investor stability and uh, further you are engaging with the rating agencies on a regular basis. Frederick also alludes to the deterioration of an exchange rate being a key concern for an investor because you can't manage those currency risks. If you could respond, sir. To what? <laughs> <laughs> now I no, have no. to bring it all up. <laughs> the the, the yeah, political the perceived. Yeah. No, I know. <laughs> let me let you take the stage here. <laughs> no, the um, I, I think the exchange rate is okay. I think we've seen it appreciating stabilized, it's okay. It's, but it's I, think, right I think there would be now, people who say it's very volatile, Minister Kigaba. It, it is, and it has been for quite a long time. And the volatility of our exchange rate doesn't emanate from uh, cabinet reshuffles because we don't have those on a frequent basis. Um, so the, what's created the volatility... I don't think I need to say anything. No, no. A, there was a murmur through the, the crowd. The volatility of the exchange rate, if we are to be honest, doesn't emanate from cabinet reshuffles, not at all. It's, it's, We've it's seen quick the, success of changes in finance ministers certainly impacting the exchange rate. Would yes. you agree? Well, yes, there. But, <laughs> but, but the, 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 the South African exchange rate has been volatile for quite a long time. Uh, let's be honest about that. Mm. It's been volatile for a long time. It's absolutely nothing to do. It, it, it could have, on occasion, have to do with um, the changes in the finance ministry, but it's been volatile not as a result of that for quite a long time. There was a time when it depreciated for, I mean, to close to, I think, You know, I think I can help you out here because I know that so, even the currency strategists uh, actually don't know where the currency is going. But let's so, rather move to the yes. political instability question and where the, you are assuring investors that there isn't political instability in South Africa. The, the, no, no, no. The, the South Africa is a democratic country. We go through periodic elections, and I don't think anybody should uh, panic when it's time. I mean, we know that every five years there is going to be an elective conference of the ruling party. There is going to be general elections. It's part of democracy. We need to accept it. That at that moment, there will be a, cont a contestation for leadership. We may emerge with a new leadership. It actually happens virtually everywhere else in the world. 
In some countries, every four years. In some countries, it even happens abruptly um, as a result of unconstitutional illegal leadership changes. In our country, all the leadership changes that we've had have been through the democratic process. There has been succession, a peaceful transition from one administration to the next. And that should really not cause anybody to panic. We should accept that it's going to happen. So for example, end of this year, the ruling party goes to an elective conference. The current president will no longer be the president of the ruling party. Come 2019, there will be a new president for the country because it's five years for elections. But what I think we need to do is, is to strengthen our institutions so that there is policy certainty and predictability, there is trust in the institutions that we have, and I think at the level of the institutions we have in the country, be it the, the courts, the, the, the various institutions, including national treasury, there has been consistency, there has been proper succession in terms of leadership. There, there are leaders that are there, there is clear succession. And to that extent, and we have a strong legal framework, strong financial institutions, I think to that extent we've got institutions that are working very well. And, and therefore that should provide the, the necessary and, and, and requisite level of confidence to business and investors that South Africa is still open for business and that South Africa is a vibrant economy and a dynamic uh, political um, uh, uh, country. Minister Schäuble, are you an Afro-optimist, sir? I am always optimist because if you engage yourself in politics, you have to be optimist, otherwise you will fail. But of course, you, you must not, uh, you, you have to be a, a realist as well. And therefore, of course, uh, just as uh, my fellow colleagues have, have said, uh, democracy itself is not a risk. Absolutely. Change, change is, is a precondition for freedom, for, for sustainable freedom. Therefore, democ of course, there is always some uncertainty. You mentioned Brexit, you mentioned the French elections at the beginning, you mentioned change in US administration. It, therefore, it's important that it must be clear, institution matters, institution matters. And then, of course, um, it's for any incoming government to make sure that, to, that confidence will not be, be lost, because if you want to get investments, you have to, to work for, for, for confidence. By the way, even in Germany, we will suffer uh, general elections in September. And I am, of course, telling, when I will be back in Germany, I will tell my fellow countrymen, please, you have to elect uh, a federal chancellor because otherwise uh, we would face major risk for Germany as well. It would, would be a major geopolitical risk, but we will manage this. But what is decisive is, in any change, we must never uh, lose confidence and we have to make sure uh, there are different views, but uh, the preconditions for uh, and institutions matter and that will be respected and, and agreement that has been agreed will be uh, taken. I want to stay with you, Minister Schäuble, just to get your insight. You mentioned the, the German election in September, but I think it's also very important to ask you about your, your thoughts on the viability of the European Union as it stands and where you think we're headed from a European Union perspective. Again, the context is that the European Union is incredibly important in the Africa context. I think I think I'm, I'm uh, of course we are in, in, in we have some differences. The, the decision of the British people uh, to vote for a Brexit has been not. Uh, we have all, uh, everyone has not been in favour of this, but they have decided to be taking the decision serious. I think European Union and UK will manage it in the negotiation to do it in a, in a proper way, but you can see. Overall, in, Euro in the European Union, beyond the UK, since the Brexit decision, there is a, a, a movement to strengthen European integration again, because people do better understand that European integration matters. And of course, if any European <coughs> member state will take its own responsibility for the future, and the future for any European member state is 
to have an, in a globalized world as, many, as much stability as, as possible that requests inclusiveness, for example, then we can all be do it together as, as Europeans. And that is the lesson. If you see uh, last election in Netherlands, a lot of people have said, oh, the Eurosceptic movements will, will, will win. They didn't. You will see the same in France on, on Sunday, I bet. I, 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 I take. You have seen the same in the election of Austria. Therefore, there is an, people have better understood after the Brexit decision that European integration counts, is worthy for everyone, and therefore I'm quite optimistic we will, uh, Europe will remain and will become a more relevant partner for the rest of the world, especially for Africa, of course. Therefore, by the way, the, our, our uh, initiative for the compact with Africa is very much supported by all European members, including, by the way, UK. I am going to take three questions from the audience, and I'm going to be a dictator about it. I will take one question from this side of the room, one from the middle of the room, and one from that side of the room. I see one already here. Thank you very much, sir. If we could get a microphone. If you could, for the purposes of the broadcast, stand, state your name, where you're from, and address the appropriate question. And please keep them brief. Mukena Makeka, young global leader from South Africa, Cape Town. Um, Africa has eight economic regions, and these economic regions, um, such as SADC, ECOWAS, are very useful because they exist to aggregate uh, stability, um, aggregate planning, as well as aggregating economic planning and thinking. My question to the forum here is that with this compact, it seems as if the G20 is engaging with individual African countries. Is there not a possibility of using these economic regions as the basis of negotiation to ensure that smaller countries can participate in the dialogue with the G20 to facilitate intra-African trade and to ensure that African tr countries don't trade, ag trade negatively against each other for the interest of the G20? The G20 is an aggregation of 20 nations and we have 54 countries and we need to reduce those asymmetries by perhaps working in economic regions as opposed to individual nations. Is this a correct provocation, or am I wrong? I think if I can go to Minister Gigaba first, yes. given the fact that, Minister, at the beginning of the discussion, we established that South Africa is the only Africa representative in the G20 will be taking on that Africa agenda. What are your thoughts on the proposal that has been put forward? Well, I actually believe that we, we it, it's, a, it's a credible proposition, um, but of course they should have, we should have had a start. We should have started somewhere. And, and I think this was a necessary start to engage with individual countries that uh, wish to engage with the compact. Um, and, and as we do that and evolve with the compact, then we need to start, and as more countries come on board, as, as, as I understand that uh, two more countries have expressed a concrete interest in participating in the compact, and there are more that have also uh, made a, a, a commitment to participate, then we, we, we would, at that moment, start looking at, at, at those um, uh, engagements with economic regions. But you must also bear in mind that uh, the, the G20 in itself is not, is not spearheading investments into these countries as a body. It's inviting investments from different countries, and those countries are engaging in bilateral investment decisions mm -hmm. with, um, with individual countries. And, and so, let, let's see how it evolves and, and then make further determinations as it goes on. But this was a credible start. Could I take a question from that side of the room, please? If we could deploy a mic. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, the panelists. Uh, Minister Gigaba, as you embark on the uh, inculcating the political will of uh, African leaders to foster inter-trade uh, cooperation. Where will you start? Now, that's my archbishop um, who just asked the question. 
Um, thank you very much. I, I think there is a number of things that we, we, we need to do, maybe just to tabulate um, three of them. Uh, one is we must diversify our economies. It's absolutely urgent uh, because it's going to be difficult to encourage any commodity producer to trade in commodities with a fellow commodity producer. Because why sell ice to the Eskimos? So first, uh, Archbishop Mahoba, it's um, diversifying the economies. It's also been spoken about quite extensively. Uh, secondly, it's, as I was suggesting, encouraging, mobilizing domestic resources to invest in infrastructure networks that do not only encourage commodity exports, but that um, encourage creating intra-African um, uh, infrastructure networks and also encourage the, the, the uh, development of, um, of, of um, fleet procurement that is going to support that drive. So three, I'm going to have to leave and it there, Minister Gigaba, but a good start. So I think that appropriately answers the question. I don't want to marginalize this side of the room. Is there a question before I move to closing panel, closing comments from my panel? I see this side of the room has chosen to be marginalized. So we're going to come back to, there we go. The opportunity has been taken by the far left. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Hi, um, this is a question for Minister Gigaba. My name is Adrian Klasa. I am with This Is Africa at the Financial Times. Um, you said in your statement earlier that um, the institutions that South Africa has should provide confidence to investors in the economy. Yet, and you say that a cabinet reshuffle shouldn't necessarily be linked to volatility. Yet, um, what we're witnessing by some arguments um, with the recent cabinet reshuffle was that a finance minister that many thought was putting a check on executive power was removed from power um, precisely because he was defiant. How does that square with your perception of how investors should still have confidence in the South African economy? Thank you. So we should have actually had that, that question perhaps at the beginning of our session. Again, I'm going to be dictatorial in my stance, and in the interest of time, I've got five minutes left. I think that the minister has given a very comprehensive statement about how he sees the democratic process unfolding in South Africa. I'm sure you can engage at a further point with the minister. So can I come back to closing comments? We've got five minutes until we close our broadcast and lose our audience across the African continent. So gentlemen, I'm going to put something to you. There are two phases to this question in the concluding comments. The first one is I want to see the biggest risk to our achieving, to Africa, achieving that 3.5% growth rate come 2019, the biggest risk in your view. And then I want to draw from Elsie Kanza, the head of the World Economic Forum on Africa. And in a recent interview, she stated that her dream is to see an African girl from a rural village sent to Mars in a spaceship designed, built, and launched in Africa. So my question is twofold to each of the panelists. One is, the key risk to the 3.5% growth rate as they see it, and perhaps put in there the opportunity to overshooting that growth rate, and then whether we will see Elsie achieve her dream in 10, 20, or 30 years if we do the right things from an African context perspective. And gentlemen, I'm afraid I do have limited time to go down the panel at this stage. Minister Schobler, I will start with you, sir. I think the biggest risk would be increasing political uh, trouble, and especially uh, 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 trouble with, with war and, and, and with terrorists and, and, and violence. That is the biggest risk. And my dream for, let's say, 30 years is that Africa is uh, a continent which uh, is a driving force for global economy because it has by far the, the biggest potential in demography. They have a huge potential of young uh, 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 people and so on. 
and therefore Africa could be, I, I know, let's say in the, in, the, in the other way. Some years ago there was a question, is Africa a, a lost continent? And my dream is Africa will be the opposite in, in, in 30 years. That's my dream. Frederick, if you could add your voice. For the risk, I will not be long. I fully agree with uh, Mr. Schäuble, political risk and, and major trouble. For the dream, uh, I think that uh, Africa um, will be more and more in the cities. I think the urban development will uh, create a, a new kind of cities, and uh, Africa can imagine and build cities that are not like the American or European cities today, but uh, cities that have developed in another way, in a more sustainable way, uh, with a lot of new services, a lot of new, new uh, building infrastructure that will really invent an efficient way to work together um, because um, they, they have to, because otherwise the development will, be, will grow too, too quickly. And I have another dream, which is that uh, there are so many global company, African companies now that have a certain size. We never mentioned that. 400 companies over $1 billion revenue in Africa. I just, just dream that they become global company and you have global leaders that are from African origin. Ulrich. I think on the, on the risk, I think I agree. A large scale disruption and a large scale political dimension would be very, very bad. And that would be not um, something that we should desire. On the dream, now look, you mentioned the year 2030, 2040, where somebody could fly to Mars. In 2035, Africa will have about 1.1 billion people at, at an age that they could work. The workforce will be about 1.1 billion. And my dream would be through a smart application of technology, through a redomicilization of demand and creating of local value chain, we have this 1.1 people busy at a very low unemployment rate in a new economic model deploying technology in a new industry. Minister Gigaba. The key risk is the persistence of poverty, inequality, and unemployment. And my dream is to see a more integrated Africa that is growing in an inclusive manner, harnessing the full potential of her people and mobilizing both domestic and international resources to address the aspirations of her people and contributing to, to human development. And on that note, I would like to thank our panelists. I would like to thank our audience across the African continent and perhaps close on this message, drawing from the World Economic Forum and the fact that Africa, to navigate the domestic and global challenges, is going to have to rely on both responsible and responsive leadership. So perhaps it's fitting to close with a message to our leaders. Africa is firmly in your hands. Her children are firmly in your hands. Please guarantee her a long, healthy, happy, secure, and all-inclusive life. On that note, thank you very much for joining us.